Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to open um, this day of science, exciting science, on the occasion of the Robert Koch Prize um, 2021, which uh, this year is uh, shared by two uh, scientists who are recognized for their groundbreaking research that shows on the one hand how our microflora trains our immune system, and on the other hand, how our intestine determines the composition of uh, the microflora. We start with a um, um, presentation of Yasmin Belkate. Algerian-born Yasmin was educated in France and received her PhD in 1996 from the Pasteur Institute working on innate responses to Leishmania uh, challenges. She then went to the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in the United States and continued to work on the regulation of immune responses to Leishmania. After a three year research stay in Cincinnati, she moved back actually to the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease um, as a research associate and um, moved her way up to now where she when she direct, directs uh, the microbiome program uh, of the Institute. She is also a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. The research of Yasmin has shown in an authoritative way how the bacteria that colonize our intestine and skin train our, um, uh, our immune system and thus help to fight of infectious agents. But on the other hand, they also train the immune system to accept food as harmless. In the case of chronic inflammation of the intestine or the skin, the dialogue between the microflora and the immune system is disturbed, resulting in a disturbance of the immune balance, which contributes decisively to diseases such as Crohn's disease and other chronic inflammations of the intestine and uh, inflammations of the skin like psoriasis. Also, but also nutrient deficiencies can disturb the dialogue between microflora and the immune system. The immune system needs energy in the form of carbohydrates and fat, but also metabolites of the microflora to be able to react well against pathogens and vaccines and to maintain immunity over time. It's a great pleasure for me, Yasmin, to welcome you here. Long time no see, but uh, I'm looking forward actually to an extremely exciting scientific presentation. The floor is yours. So it's an extraordinary privilege for me to be here today uh, at so many levels. Really humbling to, to be recipient of this prize and, and also to share that with Andrea, which I think has been really an inspiration for me in many ways. And I think a lot of the work we have done was very much inspired by you. So a joy to be here today with you. So thank you very much. Uh, and I'm also, I have to admit, this is my first public talk in two years. <laughs> I'm outside of a Zoom uh, box. So I apologize if I'm not really, um, you know, I'm gonna have to relearn that. So the work I'm gonna to present today is some, very much some of the ongoing work in the laboratory to try to understand this extraordinary relationship between the microbiota and the immune system. And maybe if I can move my slide, that would be great. You know, I told you like I have it, oh yeah, here it is. So a lot of the work we have done over the last you know, 10, 15 years has been to try to understand this extraordinary way by which the immune system is actually regulated not only as a tissue specific way, but also how environmental triggers, such as the microbiota, nutrition, or sometimes past infection can actually affect the immune system for the long term. And in the context of this really broad question that clearly we are not the only one exploring, I'm also trying, I'm gonna also discuss with you today uh, some of the work um, linked to two different parts. The first one, is really this ongoing journey we have in the laboratory to try to understand how the immune system detect the microbiota. And I'm gonna to explain to you why this is still an outstanding question. And the second one 
is really uh, not related to the microbiota, but another line of research we have in the laboratory, which is actually how previous infection can actually shape the immune system for the long term, and in particular, those that occur during pregnancy. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is not my forte to work on. The... I told you I didn't give a talk in a long time. Okay, um, there it is. Yeah, there it is. So work that we and many others have done over the last uh, 15 years, I think, at this stage, has highlighted the fact that the immune system is extremely controlled by the microbiota at every single level. Development of the immune system, which means the proper development of lymphoid structures, the seeding of the tissue with lymphocytes depend on the microbiota. And we and others have shown years ago now that actually the microbiota in the GI tract or in the skin or in other compartments acted as an adjuvant of the immune system, which means that to develop an adaptive response against pathogen, you really need the adjuvant effect of the microbiota. What has been also shown uh, more recently via the work of valipulandrum, for example, is that in humans, if you treat them with broad spectrum antibiotics, the quality of antibody responses, glycosylation pattern in particular, can be affected. Uh, we really point in human also the relationship between the microbiota and the quality of antibody response developed in the context of vaccine. Really exciting work, I think, is really the one that is done also in the context of immune checkpoint therapy. And we're very lucky over the last couple of years to be involved with some of the work that was done by Giorgio Trinkeri and others in the field, highlighting the fact that the gut microbiota really acted as an adjuvant of immune checkpoint therapy. And there is a recent work that I found partly exciting where they found that individuals that are not responding to immune checkpoint therapy can actually be rendered susceptible to the treatment, actually now respond positively to the treatment the way you want to see it, if you give them the microbiota of individuals that responded to the therapy. So this actually is a proof of principle that really there is a powerful adjuvant effect in our GI tract that can be really harnessed for many different um, uh, therapeutic outcomes. But of course, as many of we do know, is the fact that the microbiota dysregulation is underlying numerous inflammatory disorders ranging from allergy. And if it's not uh, with the cause of inflammation, it is at the minimum an amplifier of all inflammatory processes. So the question we're gonna to discuss today is actually something that uh, we decided to rethink about, which is most of what we know about the immune system came from really the pioneering work of people working on host pathogen interaction. And in this context, the immune system is really well wired to respond in an aggressive way. And postulate that were done by January or actually Polymat Singer years ago, highlighted the fact that you needed tissue damage and inflammation in order for the immune system to be alerted and engage uh, against pathogen. And it was its concept of danger signal and, 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 and alarm. But this really put it in a different kind of paradoxical uh, position in the context of the microbiota. So the microbiota is mostly outside all the body surfaces, but it's inducing these extremely potent IgA, IgG, but also uh, T cell responses in absence of inflammation. So the question we decided to ask is what is the nature of the signal that are responsible for engaging the immune system in such a quiescent way? And the second question we decided to explore is what are the unique properties and function of an immune response that is not here to control the invading agent, but clearly here to just control a relationship with the microbiota and potentially other uh, aspect of host physiology. And I'm just gonna summarize some of the work we have done over the last few years in this context. And a lot of this work was done no longer in the GI tract, although we continue to work in this fabulous compartment, but in the skin. And the reason we decided to shift in the skin for this specific question is several fold. The first one was I had an extraordinary graduate student, Shirley Naik, that joined my laboratory and really wanted to explore the role of the microbiota in the skin. And it's often, as most things happen in the laboratory, you have an extraordinary person that come in your laboratory and it's just changed your trajectory. The second one is also, at the time, Julie Segri at the NH was uncovering the diversity of the human skin microbiota. And the other aspect we found that was an int of interest for the work we wanted to do is the biomass of the microbe is very low in the skin and this given, gave us the opportunity to really play in a more subtle way on changing the microbiota composition. So this is just a summary of some of the work we have done using some of the microbes, and in particular Staphylococcus epidermidis, but we have also done work on other skin microbes. If you apply the microbe at the surface of the skin um, and 
you actually have an accumulation of lymphocytes. And in particular, CD4, CD8, gamma, delta, made cells, many different lymphocytes. And I'm showing you here, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to show you here uh, the work on the CD8 T cells that accumulate in the epidermis. The CD8 T cells, when they enter in the epidermis, have the ability to produce a cytokine in response to cognate antigen because the microbiota is there. And in a non inflammatory way, they are able to enhance antimicrobial peptide production by keratinocyte, thereby enhancing the ability of the tissue to be protected against subsequent infection. So this actually showed that adaptive response, a cognate response to these microbes, it is antigen specific, has the ability to create this broad response in the tissue that is protected. The second aspect that we found that was quite intriguing is if you take those lymphocytes and you look at the wiring, they're highly plastic. And although they express these transcription factors linked to the type 17 responses, in the context of uh, aggression, such as tissue damage, they can flip their program. And now they start to produce a large amount of TH2 cytokine like IL-13. And this actually allows the cells now to be involved in tissue repair. So this really demonstrates that these cells are not only able to promote broadly antimicrobial defenses, but also uh, engage in a fundamental aspect of host physiology that is tissue repair. And we have ongoing work in the laboratory highlighting that this repair extends beyond just the keratinocyte to the, to the sensory neuron system. So immunity to the microbiota is not here to control invading agent, there is none. It is really here first primarily to control tissue physiology in a beneficial way. But this led us to this mystery. How does this actually start? How do you actually have an immune response that is engaged without inflammatory processes? And this led us to this enigma we had in the laboratory for a few years that we were kind of like revisiting and revisiting. And it was linked to the work of Samira Tamutunu when she looked in, a, in the skin of an animal that was applied with the microbiota. And these animals have their own microbes. We add staph epi. And what she was seeing in the tissue is this really, really defined antiviral responses. It's almost like the tissue had seen a viral infection. And that was really puzzling uh, because clearly, as I mentioned before, first, this is not a virus, and two, there is no inflammation. So this led us to rethink a little bit about what we knew about the microbiota. And of course, work that has been done uh, by many different people highlighted the fundamental importance, uh, of course, of the microbiota in the control of um, antiviral defenses. And in particular, the ability of the gut microbiota to broadly promote, um, to broadly promote antiviral responses in the, in the GI tract, but also in the lung and others, in particular, as it was shown um, in the context of PDC activation. So we knew that the microbiota was able to promote those antiviral responses systemically, but the mechanism underlying this control had remained unclear. And this led us to rethink something that, uh, of course, we all know, but we tend to not maybe consider as much as we should, which is the fact that, of course, we have this extraordinary microbiome, the one that is actually, uh, we and many of us have worked here, the bacteria, the fungi, the virus that is actually colonizing tissue and control various physiological aspects. But we also have a viral. And in particular, 10% of human genome is actually composed of endogenous retroviruses that are basically remnant of past retroviral infection that have embedded themselves in our genomes. Evolutionary, those elements have been under strong pressure and have been actually neutralized, controlled by numerous processes. However, some of those elements maintain transcriptional activity and have been linked to various biological functions. So this led us to actually consider the possibility that there may be a crosstalk between the microbiota and the endogenous retroviruses. And this point was actually not also uh, completely novel because work that was done by George Cassiotis years ago already postulated a link between the ERV and the microbiota when he found that if you take a germ-free mice, there is a change in the ERV expression in the GI tract. So we decided to actually tackle these questions in the context of this crosstalk. And Jalma and Sid in the laboratory, two very talented postdoctoral fellow, one uh, is the bioinformatician and Jalma is actually a bench uh, scientist together, uh, teamed up to look at ERV expression in the context of staph epi association in the skin. And if you apply the bacteria in the skin of an animal, that again, that is not germ-free, so no response to a microbe. There is a clear upregulation, although discrete, of few ERV elements uh, within the keratinocyte uh, themselves. So, of course, those uh, elements could just have a life cycle. 
And again, in some circumstances, uh, be reverse transcribed and become double-stranded DNA. They could, of course, become also double-stranded RNA. And those elements, when they actually present the cytosol, will become an alert system for the viral antiviral defenses and could be putatively sensed by innate sensors. So to see if somehow the macrobiota could engage those responses and in particular could benefit from this reverse transcriptase activity of the host, we decided to treat the animal with uh, an anti-reverse transcriptase. That is a class of drug, drug that will be utilized in the context of treatment of prevention of retroviral infections, such as HIV, for example. So the animal was applied with staph at the surface of the skin, then treated with an anti-RT. And as you can see on the right, staph AP induced T cell responses within the skin that accumulate. And as I mentioned before, this is a very a diverse class of T cell responses, CD4, CD8, mate cells, and so forth. But if you treat the animal with an anti-RT, this is really severely decreased. So this can be visualized in a more clear way if you just look at a cross-section of the tissue. On the epidermal layer in blue, you can see the accumulation of CD4 and CD8 T cells that accumulate in response to staph AP association. Anti-RT treatment completely block the ability of those lymphocytes to accumulate in the tissue. So of course, uh, when you have uh, DNA that will accumulate uh, within the cytoplasm, as I mentioned before, it can actually be sensed by the canonical machinery that is a CGAS ting machinery. So to address the possibility that this pathway could also be involved in the uh, recognition of the macrobiota, we utilized mice that were deficient in CGAS or sting knockout mice. And in this case, you can see that both animals are no longer able to develop T cell response to staph AP. So this really points to the fact that there is really clearly a, a role for reverse transcriptase activity of the host for recognition of the skin macrobiota, and, a, and we have actually evidence of other macrobiota. And importantly, then the sigasting pathway contribute to this phenomenon. So to try to understand which mechanism are actually responsible for this sensing, we utilized an approach in which we deleted sting on different cell subsets, including keratinocytes, which I'm showing you here. So removal of sting by keratinocytes really had a profound effect on the ability of the macrobiota to be sensed by the immune system. You can see that the CD8 responses, the mate cells, and the gamma delta T cells are completely abolished if you actually just have an animal that do not have sting expression on keratinocyte, pointing really to this pathway as one of the ones responsible for the sensing of the microbiota. So the model that we propose at the moment is the following one. We find that actually the microbiota at the surface of the skin is able to engage the immune system, and we have evidence and it occurs via TLR2, as it was actually shown before, and we confirm that this is indeed the case at the level of keratinocyte. And some of this uh, TLR2 recognition had been worked by uh, Gallo, for example. We found that downstream of TLR signaling, and that has been actually this, this link between TLR signaling and ERV expression was first pointed by George Cassiotis. We found that very much like he did, then there is no regulation of ERV downstream of TLR signaling. ERV is now reverse transcribes that, and that can actually accumulate as DNA in the cytoplasm that can be sensed by the SIGA sting machinery. And this creating this mini hotspot on keratinocyte that are non-inflammatory, but nonetheless activated enough to engage dendritic cells and other cells around, allowing the induction and accumulation of a broad spectrum of immune cells in the tissue that actually accumulate and activate the tissue for physiological uh, purpose, antimicrobial defenses and tissue repair. But this led us with another question, which is of course the possibility that this relationship, this really incredible, to my opinion, relationship between those ancient virus and the macrobiota could have pathological consequences in some circumstances. And in fact, if we think about ERV, Many people will think about, for example, lupus, in which actually ERV have been shown to be contributing to inflammatory processes. So could somehow aberrant ERV recognition lead to pathological outcome of the microbiota in some circumstances? So to address this question, uh, we utilize an approach in which we change the physiological setting of the animal. And in particular, what we utilize is an approach that allows us to change the diet of the animal showing, and we had actually shown before, that if an animal is actually fed on a high fat diet, they are no longer able to develop a metastatic response with measure microbiota, but now develop inflammatory responses. So just a change in diet is sufficient to make the animal sense the microbiota as an inflammatory agent. And this can be visualized here. 
If you apply Staphypia to the surface of the skin, and this is, you know, a very gentle application. This is just a painting of the bacteria at the surface of the skin. There is no abrasion. There is absolutely no infection. There is no inflammation. This is exactly as if you were shaking the hands of someone, although we're not supposed to do that anymore. There is clearly no inflammation. If you uh, now change the diet of the animal for just a few weeks, and three weeks is actually sufficient, and this is a bit frightening when you think about when we change diet, just three weeks of high fat diet make the same bacteria cause an inflammation. So now you apply the same bacteria to the skin and inflammation appears. And this can be visualized not only by thickening of the ear, but on the right, you can really see the thickening of the epidermal layer, and in particular, the ability of the keratinocyte to proliferate in the tissue as evidenced by K67 expression. So this is the setting that we decided to utilize to look at ERV expression. Once again, Chalma and C decided to sequence the keratinocytes uh, and were able to actually show that indeed there is a synergy effect. When you have an animal that is actually fed a high fat diet and apply with staphypi, there is really an aberrant upregulation of ERVs and also in particular different part of those viruses, the GAG, the propyl and the envelope that can actually be reactivated in the context of this high fat diet plus the bacteria. On the right and underline, you can actually see elements that have been shown to have an active reverse transcriptase activity in the host. And this was done in collaboration with a leader in the field, George Cassiotes, that actually had proven that those um, activities were actually indeed uh, present. So then what we decided to do is to see to which extent this reverse transcriptase activity once again could contribute to the inflammatory process caused uh, by this bacteria. You apply the bacteria at the surface of the skin, as I mentioned before, if the animal is fed a high fat diet in red, there is an inflammatory processes. However, if you have treated the animal with an NTRT, the pathology is at least partially uh, diminished, really pointing to the idea that in the context of this inflammatory process, the reverse transcriptase activity of the host really does contribute to the inflammatory response induced by the bacteria. So what we have actually at the moment is, is a model that really proposed that we have yet to discover many, many different crosstalk. And I found partially fascinating that actually there is this co-opting of these really ancient viral partners by the macrobiota as a way to engage in this really fundamental relationship with the host. So really clearly the endogenous retroviruses are really not only, I used to believe that the bacteria were the adjuvant of the system, but I think I was wrong. I think the ERVs are likely the real adjuvant of the system. And they really are the one dictating the ability of the host to sense the microbiota. So we found an ERV expression is required for response to skin commensals, but we have now evidence this is not just in the skin. We have evidence that the lung in particular is heavily controlled by ERVs and early evidence, and it may be also relevant to the gut environment. And we found that the C-gasting pathway is important for the homeostatic relationship between the host and its microbiota. So the model we have is the following one. The microbiota is sense. Uh, in this specific example, staph AP will be TLR2, but it will be other form of uh, innate sensor in the context of other bacteria. Downstream of TLR2, a pregulation of ERV that activate keratinocyte via the ability of this ERV to become DNA. This creates a type 1 responses, an antiviral program that engage the immune system in a very positive way. On the other hand, in the context of a high fat diet, there is now uh, an aberrant expression of ERV in the context of staph AP association, and this now tilt the balance toward inflammatory processes, and the same encounter cause inflammatory responses and tissue damage. So I think we need to think about the ERV that are present in the tissue are really the elements that control the threshold of activation of the, the, the tissue. At low level, this allow homeostatic relationship with the microbiota. At high level, now the balance is tilted and you can actually cause inflammatory responses. So we're now in the process of revisiting this question in numerous ways. First, to try to really understand the mechanism by which those ERVs are really, really upregulated and really why there is such a tissue specific ability of different ERV to be upregulated. Something I haven't discussed here, but there's an extraordinary partitioning of which ERV is expressed on different cells. And that's by itself I found really, really intriguing. Another thing that is fascinating is the fact that different tissue have different ERV. And in fact, as I'm gonna show you, right now, humans have different ARVs. So I'm gonna just um, discuss that briefly. So we're looking also at how diet, genetic predisposition or infection disturb this relationship with the ARVs and how somehow this complex interaction can actually tilt the balance between health and inflammatory processes. 
So just a couple of words on, on ongoing work that we're doing right now. And this is done in a collaboration uh, at uh, the NIH with Kevin Hall, who's actually an investigator that has done a lot of dietary intervention in humans in which uh, people are brought to the clinical center of the NIH and actually stay for six weeks in a hospital setting. And they actually given diet in a very, very controlled way. And it's actually is the most controlled diet intervention that ever been done because the only thing that actually they can eat is what has been provided to them. And they also followed in a very numerous omic ways. And this is done also in collaboration with Verena Link in my laboratory who's a, a bio bioinformaticians. So uh, the first part of this work was actually published this year by uh, Kevin, and it's actually very much about the metabolic impact of this diet. But what we are now doing is really with very now the immune impact of this diet. The first thing that we're doing that I found absolutely fascinating is just a couple of weeks of vegan as opposed to ketogenic diet can have an opposite effect on the immune system. Where the vegan diet is actually able to dramatically enhance innate responses, while the ketogenics tend to be more uh, optimized to actually promote uh, adaptive response, which I found striking that in human you can have such a clear signature with a diet intervention. And of course, we're also looking uh, on, on the microbiota as it was shown by, by others. This is of course massively controlled by Diet. But the point that I wanted to discuss with you that relate to my previous point is the ARVs. So what we found, and this is not that surprising, but, but what I was surprised, the fact that means that may not have been studied as much as I think it should, humans are extremely variable in the level of ERV they express, not only at the level of the whole PBNC, but the level at individual cells in the PBNC. And I'm just going to show you here the very a broad overview. So every individual has a different class of ERVs that are upregulated. But what we found really, really intriguing, and this is really the beginning of a journey, is that the class of genes that are the most changed by diet interventions were actually the ERVs. So they're really suggesting that ERV are exquisitely sensitive to cues provided by nutrition and the environment. And this could be at least in part explain the crosstalk between nutrition and, and the immune system, at least in part. There are many other reasons why the immune system controls the immune system, but this is something that we're really excited to follow. And this actually led me to uh, the other part of my talk that is very different, which is an interest of ours for the last few years, which is to try to understand the long-term consequence of infection. So of course, we, I'm fascinated by this cr cross talk of the microbiota that is here to shape the immune system. But we know we have to remember that we are animals living in an environment. And as we have sadly experienced over the last couple of years, highly susceptible to infection. This infection can have traces and they can have long-term consequences and un a situation that we are unfortunate, unfortunately highly aware of today. So over the years, we have actually explored this question to numerous systems and have actually found that certain infection can let really long trace and long damaging effect on tissue physiology and function. And in the context of this very specific question, uh, really uh, an extraordinary uh, postdoctoral fellow joined my laboratory a few years ago and decided to revisit this question, not only in the adult stage, but what happened in the context of early life and in particular pregnancy. And the reason she was interested by this question is the following one. She felt that a lot of the work that had been done on infection and pregnancy pertained to really dramatic infections, such as the one caused by listeria or toxoplasma or Zika, those that will actually have devastating consequences on the child. And she postulated, well, you know, during pregnancy, we're also exposed to mild infection. You have a cold, you have a flu, and clearly you recover from it. Could those infections be perceived by the fetus? And could this actually have long-term consequences? So to do that, she utilized a model of infection that is caused, uh, called Yersinia pseudotuberculosis. This is a microbe we have used quite a lot in the laboratory recently. And in particular, we use the mutants that create a very, very mild infection. And it's an infection that is cleared very quickly, five days after infection, does not cross a placental barrier, and the animal have really barely any symptoms. So they do not wait, lose weight, and they basically survive perfectly fine. This um, allows us to have really a maternally restricted infection, and then um, a Ying was able to actually just look at the offspring of these infected mothers and looked at the different tissue responses. And what she was able to show, and it was really quite uh, surprising, is when she looked at the signature in the different tissue, it was a very discrete signature within the GI tract and not other tissue. So the offspring born from a mother, from a dam that had been infected, 
only express enhanced TH17 responses in the small intestinal lamina propria or the large intestinal lamina propria. So and there is no change in ILCs, there is no change in other form of immunity in the tissue. So to see this could be somehow linked to the ability of the host to respond to an infection, we utilize a microbe that, of course, someone in this room knows very well, Salmonella. And we utilize this microbe to see if there is a change in the ability of the animal to respond to the infection. So the animals were infected or not, and the offspring of these animals were actually then a challenge with a Salmonella. And as you can see, if the dam had been infected, there is an enhanced ability of the animal to actually, the offspring to be protected against the infection, and in particular uh, within um, peripheral organ. So this actually supported the idea that it may have been a heightened level of activation in this uh, offspring, allowing potentially enhanced immune responses. So to understand the kind of mechanism that could be linked to these type 17 responses, but also enhanced innate response and adaptive response to a pathogen, Ying looked at the cytokine potentially produced by the mother that could actually influence the offspring. She looked at the serum of these infected dams and found that one in particular was highly expressed and it was IL-6, which is of course a very ubiquitous cytokine in the context of inflammation. And then she did two very simple experiments. The first one is to take a dam that was actually infected and inject just once with IL-6. So, so one single injection of a cytokine. And as you can see here, um, I don't know if you can see it. If you can see here, there is an upregulation of uh, um, TH17 if the offspring is delivered from a dam that had been injected with IL-6, but not other cytokine tested. What she also found that was actually probably more convincing is if you take an animal that is infected, the dam was infected with Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, then treated with anti-IL-6. First, it had no, no impact on the infection itself. But what she found is it had an impact on the offspring. The offspring that developed TH17 responses if the dam had been infected do not anymore have those TH17 responses if you block 17 in the mother. So this supported the idea that IL-6 from the dam were actually able somehow to influence the offspring immune system. So how does it work? So as we know, the tissue of a developing fetus is equipped with potentially receptor for cytokine. And that's by itself, I found it absolutely fascinating. If you looked at different epithelial cells, they clearly are already equipped during development to send cytokines. So Ying looked by, uh, at the receptor uh, expression, and in particular, the one that I linked to the um, you know, canonical and, and uh, sensing of IL-6, and find that this IL-6 receptor was indeed expressed on epithelial cells of the offspring. So she, this is not just a mouse phenomenon. And if she went and actually visited publicly available data sets uh, in human and found that indeed there is, uh, an high, uh, an, um, there is also um, an expression of the L6 receptor in human fetal uh, epithelial cells. As I mentioned before, what I found really absolutely fascinating is the fact that an expression of receptor cytokine by those fetal cells is very tissue specific. So the GI tract is uniquely equipped with this IL-6 receptor, but if you looked at the lung or the skin epithelium, there is no expression. And in fact, what is really, really interesting and not shown here, the epithelium and the lung express other receptors for other cytokines. And that tells you then somehow maybe the immune system is wired to sense different kinds of infection in different tissue, and this may differentially impact the immune system for the long term. And we are now in the process of evaluating this, um, this uh, possibility. So to see if IL-6 alone, and I'm summarizing here a lot of work because, because of time purpose, what Aing was able to show, and I'm gonna summarize that later, is really this was an epigenetic mark that was imposed on tissue stem cells for the long term. But the, one, the point that I wanted to actually uh, finish with is actually the fact that IL-6 alone can really rewire the immune system for the long term. So she just took a time pregnant female injected with IL-6, and she was able to show that now if you take the offspring and infect them with salmonella, there is a delay in the death that could actually occur in response to this really lethal infection. And there is also a heightened ability of the animal to control the infection. So this actually showed that just one single exposure to heightened level of IL-6 is sufficient to have a long-term consequence of the offspring. And I would like to say that this consequence is not short-term. One year post-birth, the animal was still at a better place to control infection than actually a, an animal that was controlled. But one thing that we need to remember is immunity always come at a cost. 
And we have unfortunately witnessed that in high income country with the dramatic enhanced of inflammatory processes that are we experiencing. So to try to test this possibility, Ying utilized a different model, including a T-cell colitis model, which I'm not showing you here, but also the DSS colitis model. And she found that if you take an offspring from a dam that had been either infected or IL-6 injected, these offspring are in fact more susceptible to inflammatory responses. This can be visualized here in orange and red, where you can see that these offspring are more susceptible to colitis. And this can be also visualized in the right, when you can see a shortening of the colon post um, this chemical damage. And a very similar outcome was observed using a more um, a physiological system, which I think the T-cell transfer colitis is actually more relevant to IBD, where we also find heightened inflammation caused by this T-cell transfer in the offspring. So as I mentioned before, I summarized a lot of, of data very quickly, but I'm just gonna conclude by saying that actually, it's, I find it quite fascinating the fact that the, the, the fetus could actually co-opt maternal immune responses as a way to, as a way to pro provide this tissue specific uh, education. And we can really imagine that this may be a system that is in place as a way to edu educate the offspring to infection that are really concomitant and around the area of the, of the mother. So this is actually a system that may be very flexible and may allow different kinds of education based on the kind of pathogen encountered by the mother during pregnancy. So the model that Ying has actually done is the following one. She found in the context of infection, IL-6 is produced, oh, I'm sorry, IL-6 is produced by, um, by the dam. And we found that IL-6 have the ability to cross the placental barrier. And we found that there is a STAT3 phosphorus 3 activation on the epithelial cells just a few minutes after injection. So clearly IL-6 is uniquely able to just cross the placental barrier and signal the epithelium of the fetus. This is actually now able to act on the epithelial cells of the developing fetus, and in particular to impose what is considered an epigenetic, an epigenetic stem cell memory. This concept of stem cell, tissue stem cell memory has been highlighted recently in the context of work that was done by Schutinaik, for example, when she was with Ellen Fuchs, but also uh, Samia Beyaz and others. And I think it's a fundamental principle that shows that tissue stem cells, the ones that are required for the rebuilding and the regeneration of tissue, are subjected to just, uh, they can sense inflammation and can develop a long-term memory. So this is exactly what Ying found, and she did that via ataxic and other processes to show that those stem cells in the developing fetus acquire this epigenetic memory that, trans that actually translate in the adult stage. These cells are now in a different state of activation, which makes them they are able now to respond differently to inflammatory processes. They can sense better the microbiota, which explains heightened TH17 responses. I haven't had time to show you that. But they also have better protective responses. And we have tested numerous pathogens, such as Citrobacter, for example, but also Salmonella, and many others. And they also have a better response to vaccines. So really, the tissue is actually better able to respond. But this actually comes to a cost. Heightened immunity comes always at the cost of heightened predisposition to inflammatory disorders, something that we also need to take into account. So I think, of course, much more remains to be done, uh, and in particular to try to understand really the deep mechanism of this epigenetic memory, which I think we talk a lot about, but really how this really work is something that remains to be addressed. And I think the crosstalk between stem cells, biology, and actually uh, uh, inflammation is, I think, an area of extraordinary importance if you think about the long-term consequence of inflammation and the long-term consequence of infection, something that, as I mentioned before, we are sadly experiencing at a massive level worldwide. But let's remember that COVID is not the first infection we had. Children in daycare had been infected for years and years and years, and those cumulative costs may have actually um, accumulated over the years and may explain, at least in part, the heightened susceptibility to inflammatory disorders we see in high-income country and middle-income countries. So on that, I have to thank uh, all the people in the work. I have to say that I've been an extremely lucky person over the years, and I have the joy to work with fabulous people that join me from all around the planet. So um, they, they make my life wonderful, and they are always challenging me, and I thank them all very much for being here for me and for being here for the scientific community. Aying, as I mentioned before, and, and also Jalma and Sidam Off are going to be uh, developing their own program very soon. Many collaborators over the years, but for the purpose of this specific talk, I have to give a specific, specific credit to George Cassiotes. 
uh, who's a deep thinker about ERV biology. And he's really the one in many ways that has inspired this work. And it was really a great chance for me to be able to collaborate with him on this project. And on that, I have to thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.